Well, this morning we're going to be continuing in the books of the books, the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking at chapter 18 and 19. But before we do, we're going to be starting in 1 Corinthians, another letter that Paul wrote. The thing that I want you to realize about the New Testament versus the Old Testament is that the Old Testament, for the most part, is considered a history book that kind of goes from the beginning of time all the way through up until Jesus' birth. That there is history when it comes to their law, there's history when it comes to events, there's poetry that represents the history of their culture, but a lot of it is history and it walks sequentially with the exception of one of the most, uh, the, the, the book of Job. The book of Job, Wooden, uh, scholars believe it transpired before Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. But otherwise, for the most part, it's sequential order moving through history. When we look at the New Testament, though, Luke chapter 1, when we uh, first hear about John the, the Baptist being conceived, that starts in uh, the year about 6 BC. And when we get to the end of Revelation, John's letter that he wrote on the Isle of Patmos, it's about the year 95 AD. So we have about a hundred year span of time that went from the beginning of Luke 1 to the end of the New Testament. And when we look at it, the four Gospels basically go from the year 6 BC to about somewhere in 33-ish AD. So the first 30 or so years of that hundred year span is Ada telling the story of who Jesus is. So the rest of the New Testament covers a time span of about 60 or so years. So when we look at the Old Testament, we think of history, we think of this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But when we look at the New Testament, a lot of it is not so much a history book, but it's more like a newspaper, or maybe even better for today, an email thread. Some of you, if you've ever written on a long email thread that you responded and somebody else responded, and then somebody else responds, and then you have to respond to their response. And it starts kind of getting this messy spider web of what happened and what order did it happen. And so today we're going to be looking at this starting in 1 Corinthians 12. And I want you to hear this before I jump into our, our passage. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. It says this. There is one body, but it has many parts. But all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We were all baptized by one Holy Spirit. And so we are all formed into one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of just one part. It has many parts. Suppose the foot says, I am not a hand, so I don't belong to the body. By saying this, it cannot stop being part of the body. And suppose the ear says, I am not an eye, so I don't belong to the body. By saying this, it cannot stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how could it hear? If the whole body were an ear, how could it smell? God has placed each part in the body just as he wanted it to be. If all the parts were the same, how could there be a body? As it is, there are many parts, but there is only one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, it is just the opposite. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are the ones we cannot do without. The parts that we think are less important, we treat with special honor. The private parts aren't shown, but they are treated with special care. The parts that can be shown don't need special care. But God has put together all the parts of the body, and he has given more honor to the parts that didn't have any. In that way, the parts of the body will not take sides. All of them will take care of one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part shares in its joy. You are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. And how true that is for all of us in this room is that we're all a part of the body of Christ. Now, it's easy to look at other people's giftings and say, well, that person, they have the ability of playing guitar, or that person, they have the ability of teaching, or that person is the most hospita or hospitable person, they are so friendly, they remember every single person's name. I know one pastor, a uh, friend in, in our district, that if he meets you once, he has your name memorized for life. I don't know how he does it. And not only does he know the people in his church, I've went out to eat with him in his community, 
and the different waiters or waitresses will walk up, the owners will walk up, and he's like naming them by name. We, we had a big uh, pastor's event that happened in, in his city. We all went out to lunch at TGI Fridays. He brought the entire cook staff and wait staff out. And he starts going one by one, encouraging and naming each and every single employee. And I'm like, how do you do this? It's a gift. He has a gift of encouragement. And for each of us, it's easy to look at what somebody else can do or what they can't do and say, well, I'm not anything. But we're comparing our bloopers to somebody else's highlight reel. We, we look at it and say, well, they can do this but I can't, so I'm not any good. And when we look at this passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians, that's what it's really getting at. The fact of, well, I'm not an eye, so I might as well, you know, I, I can't see, so I don't really matter. Here's the important thing. My eye has the ability to see what's in front of it, but it cannot move and see what's behind me unless the rest of my body moves with it. The hand can say that it can pick things up and it can grasp things. But if it doesn't have a bicep or a tricep to move it, it can't actually pick it up. And at the same time, we can look at all the other different organs that are inside that if we don't have a pumping heart, you may not be able to see the heart, but the heart is needed in order to pump blood so that everything that is seen can actually do its job. And that is so true of our church. The church in general, every single person is needed. And even when we look at different churches in a community, it's so easy to say, well, that church, well, they're this. Or this church, all they care about is winning people to Christ. They don't disciple them enough. Let's be excited about the fact that God is using that church to win people to Christ. And if all of a sudden those people can't take the next step there, they'll take the next step somewhere else. Each church, God is placed in a community in order to do the job of winning people to Christ, discipling them in multiplication so that the entire world can know who Jesus is. So this morning, as we look into Acts 18, what I want you to realize through today is that no matter who you are in this room, you have a purpose. Because you're going to see two individuals in this passage today that in the grand scheme of things, this is the main time in Acts 18 and 19 where you even see them referenced. You see two other moments where Paul calls them out to say, they say hello or tell them I said hello. This is their one moment to shine, but they changed the church. They changed the early church. So we're going to start looking at Acts 18, 1 through 11. I'm going to do a little skip over uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple moments and jump to verse 18. But this is starting in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, who was a native of Pontus. Aquila had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. The emperor Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers just as he was. So he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath day he went to the synagogue. He was trying to get both Jews and Greeks to believe in the Lord. Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia. Then Paul spent all his time preaching. He was a witness to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, but they opposed Paul. They treated him badly. So he shook out his clothes in protest. Then he said to them, God's judgment against you will be your own fault. Don't blame me for it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went to the house next door. It was the house of Titus Justus, a man who worshipped God. Crispus was the synagogue leader. He and everyone living in his house came to believe in the Lord. Many others who lived in Corinth heard Paul. They too were baptized and believed they were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Don't be afraid, he said. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one will attack you and harm you. I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. He taught them God's word. So you see Paul, he's planting a church. It's the terminology we use today is he's a church planter. He's going to a community that doesn't have a church, and he is sharing God's word, and he is building something where there was nothing. When we think of a lot of church planters today, we have this idea of like a, have an entrepreneurial mindset of, I've got something that you need, so let me share the very thing that you need with you so that you can come and know who Christ is. And so Paul is here. He's working with uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and they're making tents. He doesn't want to be a burden on, on this church, especially because it's being launched that they don't know the, the whole process, that this is what you do as a church, and we support one another, that we see with the early church in Jerusalem, where they're all giving 
to those who have needs that's not in existence yet. So in order to not take away from people, he's working to make tents. And he's working alongside other people to make tents, and he stays there for a year and a half doing this. We jump ahead to verse 18. It says, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria. Priscilla and Aquila went with him. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centuria. He did this because he had made a promise to God. They arrived at Ephesus. There Paul said goodbye to Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and talked with the Jews. The Jews asked him to spend more time with them, but he said no. As he left, he made them a promise. If God wants me to, he said, I will come back. Then he sailed from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem. There he greeted the church. He then went down to Antioch. Paul spent some time in Antioch. Then he left and traveled all over Galatia and Phrygia. He gave strength to all the believers there. At that time, a Jew named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was an educated man from Alexandria. He knew the scriptures very well. Apollos had been taught the way of the Lord. He spoke with great power. He taught the truth about Jesus, but he only knew about John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Priscilla and Aquila heard him. So they invited him to their home. There they gave him a better understanding of the way of God. Apollos wanted to go to Achaia. The brothers and sisters agreed with him. They wrote to the believers there. They asked them to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who had become believers by God's grace. In public meetings, he argued strongly against Jews who disagreed with him. He proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. There's so much that in here, especially when we say that, well, there's history, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And even as I sat down Monday, I'm like, what is it, God, that you want me to pull out of this passage? And this idea with Priscilla and Aquila kind of kept coming back to me. Because I think there's a lot of us that we can view ourselves at times like Priscilla and Aquila. I'm a tent maker. I've got this ability. But I don't have this significant uh, personality. I don't have this ability to get up and teach. I, don't, I can't do this. I can't do that. And we can focus on all the things that we can't do. When you look at them, and it, it says, if in this moment for the church, they're making tents. That's, that's all they're doing. And it's easy to say, well, God, I'm, I'm not anybody special. And I think if we're all being honest, we've all had that period at some point in our life where we feel like, I'm not that good, I'm not that great, there's nothing special about me. But Priscilla and Aquila spent a year and a half with Paul. They spent time side by side making tents with Paul. You have to believe that knowing who Paul is and knowing what his, uh, his nature is, that he loves telling people about Jesus, loves telling about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they had to pick up something from them. And so when we look at this, there's a whole lot that we can pull out. And the first thing that kind of hit me is we have Paul taking them from their home in Corinth, going to Ephesus, and then he leaves them high and dry. Imagine that you, you're traveling with your friend, you know that he's an evangelist, and he goes from place to place to speak. He takes you to the first place and says, you, you stay here, I'm going to Jerusalem kind of comes off a little bit rude there. But when we look at it, he cuts his hair, and it may seem like a really random, weird thing for Paul to do, until we realize what Paul is most likely doing here. Is that most likely the very thing that he is doing is he's taking a Nazarite uh, vow. When we look at Numbers in the Old Testament, chapter 6, 1 through 8, it says this, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Suppose a man or woman wants to make a special promise. They want to set themselves apart to the Lord for a certain period of time. They want to be Nazarites. Then they must not drink any kind of wine. They must not drink vinegar made out of wine of any kind. They must not drink grape juice. They must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are Nazarites, they must not eat anything grapevine, uh, grapevines produced. They must not eat, even eat the seeds or skins of grapes. They must not use razors on their heads. They must not cut their hair during the whole time they have set themselves apart to the Lord. They must be holy until that time is over. They must let the hair on their heads grow long. And they must not go near a dead body during that whole time. But what if their father or mother dies? Or what if their brother or sister dies? They, then they must not make themselves unclean because of them. The hair on their heads should they are set apart for God. During the whole time, they are set apart. They are holy to the Lord. And so what a lot of scholars believe, there's a little bit of going back and forth with this. Because typically when you finish a Nazarite vow, you would go to Jerusalem first. You would cut your hair. 
And then part of the process of finishing the vow is you would go and you would take the hair and you would put it on the altar and they would burn the hair. And so in this moment, we see Paul get on the boat and he cuts his hair and then they go to Ephesus. He drops them off and then after Ephesus, he's on his way to Jerusalem. And so what a lot of, a lot of scholars think is that it, whether or not it's a Nazarite vow, that he's following this sort of a sequential events, that he's going to Jerusalem because we see when he arrives in Jerusalem, he's only there for a moment. But the belief is that he then took that to end his Nazarite vow. What was his vow for? That during this time where he was planting the church in Corinth, that he was setting himself apart to be holy in God's eyes as he was setting out on this endeavor. And so we see this moment where Paul is walking a different journey. He told the Ephesians that if it's God's will, I'll come back to you. But he intentionally leaves them in Ephesus and then goes off to Jerusalem. And I think there's a reason why this whole sequence happens the way it does. You see, while Paul drops him off in Ephesus, he's off doing uh, the, the next couple things that God has called him to do. Apollos shows up in Ephesus. And who does Apollos run into? Priscilla and Aquila. The very two people that have spent a year and a half with Paul, learning from Paul, learning his teachings. Apollos is a, a scholar. He's, you would view him as an evangelist at the time. He knew God's word. He knew how to preach God's word. That he had a command of the stage when he was teaching God's word. But then all of a sudden, here's Priscilla and Aquila, two tent makers. Not a formal knowledge of theology, not people that you would ever see them in scripture put up in front of people teaching. But what do they do? They're in uh, Ephesus now. They bring him into their home. They begin teaching him part of the, the knowledge of who God is that he hasn't experienced yet. It's not Apollos learning directly from God. You don't see Apollos having like Paul's moment at Damascus where all of a sudden he has a vision of Jesus. He learns from two lay people. And there's a lot of times it's easy to look at the church and say, well, this is all I am. This is what my role is. Never view your role in the church as, well, this is all I am. Because wherever God has placed you, there is an opportunity, there's a moment, there's something that you are challenged to do that nobody else in this room is. Imagine for a moment the idea, and this is why I keep bringing it up every single week with, with Trump Retreat, you can say, well, yeah, there's going to be 20 cars there. Do they really need that 21st car? What if the way we just happen to line up our cars on that Wednesday night, you're the 21st car, and somebody comes down and they go car after car, and they're not asking questions about the church, but all of a sudden, God's slowly chipping away at their heart, that their, their heart starts hard, all of a sudden they see this love, they see this joy that's coming from people, and then they get to the 21st car and say, tell me about this church. But the 21st car was never there. They may not have that moment. That so often you have an opportunity where God has placed you. Last week, I put myself on the spot when I did that entire uh, illustration on the fly. And it's a fun moment, and everyone's like, wow, that, that's incredible. Here's the thing. Each and every one of us can do it. We can use the very giftings and the knowledge and the wisdom that God has placed into us. Every one of us is unique in here. Every one of us has a different opportunity to reach a different grouping of people that other people can't reach. As long as our hearts are beating, blood is going through our bodies, that we are alive, God has a mission and a call for you to be involved with something. None of us should ever be sitting on the sidelines. We're, we should always be completely focused and in the game, knowing the fact that our moment could come, that we may view ourselves as, I'm just a second string or I'm just a third string that I'm never going to get in the game. God's never going to really use me, but what if all of a sudden there's a moment where God says, I want you. This is your moment to shine. God doesn't have Paul teach Apollos. He has two tent makers who, the Bible doesn't show us that he, they have this formal knowledge. He uses two tent makers to change the teaching pattern for Apollos. And here's the thing. Apollos, he arrives in Ephesus. He's not there for very long. Because he asked the believers to be able to go to Achaia. What is the capital city of that province? Corinth. He goes to the very spot where 
Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul just came from, where they were struggling, where they weren't having any more success, that the Jews were arguing with Paul, that Paul wasn't being able to convince them of what the truth is, of who Jesus is. Apollos learns from the two tent makers that Paul taught. He then goes back to Corinth, and it, let, me, let me just come back into the scripture. It's, it's, you know, I want to make sure I say that right. In public meetings, he argued strongly against Jews who disagreed with them. He proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Apollos was able to do what Paul was not able to do because the people that Paul taught taught Apollos. And then Corinth was changed. That there's moments where you feel like, God, I don't understand why you're moving me from here to over there. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not done here yet. I've got greater things that I want to do for you. That this is where I'm supposed to be. And God's saying, I need to move you over here to get you out of my way so that I can accomplish what I want to here. That you're not done yet, but God says, I'm done with you here because there's a bigger mission over here. And we get frustrated with it because, God, I want to see this come to fruition. I want to believe that all of this is possible. And God says, I need to get you out of your own way so that I can rise up a Priscilla and Aquila so that they can do the teaching that you've already taught them to somebody else so that somebody else can go over here and make an impact and change the kingdom. And you can start what's next. But a lot of times that's a struggle because we don't want to do that. We don't want to... When we want our own glory, when we want to receive the praise, when we want to see something come to fruition, it becomes about us and it doesn't become about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In the moment it's about us and us seeing something come to fruition, then we start realizing that it's not of God anymore. It's of us. It's of man. The Corinthian church, you never really see them in, in Scripture give the praise to Priscilla and Aquila that they're due. We don't see this moment of, we're so thankful to Priscilla and Aquila that they taught Apollos so Apollos could teach us and could change things and challenge things and move things along. But I'm here to tell you today that if the church doesn't have Priscilla's and if the church doesn't have Aquila's, the church doesn't happen and the church doesn't move forward. And so if you view yourself today, if nobody even knows what I do, I'm in the background. Here's the thing, if the church doesn't have servants, then things don't get done. That... Something could happen to me today that it's easy to go out and get another person to speak on stage. A speaker is replaceable because it's not about what I'm saying, it's about what God's saying through me. But if a church doesn't have servants, if a church doesn't have encouragers, if a church doesn't have prayer warriors, if a church doesn't have every gift, then the church doesn't move forward. You see, if you think about it, if we're going off that analogy from 1 Corinthians, if the pastor, let's just say the pastor is the tongue, the tongue that's communicating what God's trying to say, the body can still do quite a bit if the tongue is silent. But a tongue laying on the ground is like nothing. A tongue doesn't have the ability of processing thought. Here's the thing, every single person in here, we make up the body of Christ, allowing us to do what God has called us to do. And the moment that we think it's just about us, the moment where we think, well, the church couldn't exist without me. That's the moment where God's going to humble us and knock us down a couple pegs so that somebody else can raise up so he can prove this is my church. I, I try and be very hesitant a lot of times of saying that the Shores Church is my church. I love when I hear people in this church say, but for me, I want to personally be careful because I never want to say, I want to grow my church because this isn't my church. This is God's church. This is Jesus's church. I get to be a steward. I get to be an under-shepherd of growing his church. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to do that, but realizing that I'm just a single part of this. It's all of us together. As we move into Acts 19, we see this in verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to Ephesus. When he arrived, he found some believers there. So this is Paul now having done all of his journeys. He's headed back to Ephesus now. When he arrived, he found some believers there. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? No, they answered. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptiz baptized people, calling them to turn away from their sins. He told them to believe in the one who was coming after him. Jesus is that one. 
after hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul placed his hands on them. Then the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in languages they had not known before. They also prophesied. There was about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue. There he spoke boldly for three months. He gave good reasons for believing the truth about God's kingdom, but some of them wouldn't listen. They refused to believe. In public, they said evil things about the way of Jesus. So Paul left them. He took the believers with him. Each day he uh, talked with people in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years, so all the Jews and Greeks who lived in Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord. God did amazing miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were sick. When this happened, their sicknesses were healed and evil spirits left them. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus to set free those who were controlled by demons. They said, in Jesus' name, I command you to come out. He is the Jesus that Paul is preaching about. Seven sons of Sceva were doing this. Sceva was a Jewish a chief priest. One day, the evil spirits answered them, I know Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on Sceva's sons. He overpowered them all. He gave them a terrible beating. They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. The Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus heard about this. They were all overcome with fear. They held the name of the Lord Jesus in high honor. Many who believed now came and openly admitted what they had done. A number of those who had practiced evil magic brought their scrolls together. They set them on fire out in the open. They added up the value of the scrolls. The scrolls were worth more than someone could earn in two lifetimes. The word of the Lord spread everywhere. It became more and more powerful. Before I expound on, on this passage, I want you to hear this. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 17. If you remember the beginning, I said that we have the Old Testament that operates more as a history book. New Testament operating more as an email chain going back and forth. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17 says, Brothers and sisters, I make my appeal to you. I do this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that all of you are, agree with one another in what you say. I ask that you don't take sides. I ask that you are in complete agreement in all that you think. My brothers and sisters, I have been told you are arguing with one another. Some people from Chloe's house have told me this. Here's what I mean. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Peter. And still another says, I follow Christ. Does Christ take sides? Did Paul die on the cross for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except for uh, Crypus and Gaius. No one can say that you were baptized in my name. It's true that I also baptized those who lived in the house of Stephanus. Besides that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the good news. He commanded me not to preach with wisdom and fancy words that would take all the power away from the cross of Christ. When we look at that passage, when Paul is back in Ephesus and he's doing all this teaching that from, the, from Acts 19 that I just shared a moment ago, he's writing the letter of 1 Corinthians. Because the Corinthian church is looking and saying, well, Apollos is here, and Apollos is trying to teach this, but Paul is here first, and Paul is trying to do this. And you see Paul starting, like, he gets it. He understands the fact that this whole church thing isn't about him. It's about Jesus getting the glory. He realizes that God moved me from Corinth, moved me over here. I'm reaching out to the people in Ephesus now. It's about Jesus getting the glory. Because he started the church, but he doesn't need to get all the attention. That people were going back and forth. Well, what about this individual or this individual? And so often it happens in different churches. Well, this pastor did this, but now you're doing this. And I like the way that the pastor 30 years ago did it, and this, and this, and it's not about any individual, it's about the body of Christ being the body of Christ, doing the things that God calls that particular body to do. And when we do that, we start seeing things happen. Because here's the problem, you have the sons of Sceva in this passage, who think that they can just do the very things that Paul can do. Paul is consistent. Paul is reaching out to the Jews. He's reaching out to the Gentiles. He's trying to make a difference. They kick him out of the synagogue, so he goes over to the lecture hall. When he's in the lecture hall, he's trying to teach, and he's there. And he consistently is Paul. He consistently is following after God. Imagine if a simple hanky could touch your hand, and then it could be taken to someone else, and the anointing of God is so prevalent on your life that that simple hanky that touched you could heal somebody else. 
That takes a life living what God has called you to do. That takes a life of holiness for that kind of thing to happen. And the sons of Sceva think that they can just imitate that. That they can just make it happen. Um, I'm going to go out and preach in the name of Jesus. I'm going to go preach in the name of, of Paul who follows after Jesus. And imagine if an evil spirit were to jump out at you and say, I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. But who are you? That's a haunting phrase. That, that is so haunting to me that if I was in that spot of saying, well, in the name of Jesus, come out. I know who Jesus is, but who are you? And I think so many Christians, they try and go through, well, in the name of Jesus that my pastor preached about, be gone. And there's a lack of confidence there. We see Priscilla and Aquila, they see the opportunity, they know what God has placed in them, and they are ready to step up when it's time to step up. But for each and every one of us, are we ready to step up or are we ready to say, in the name of that person who spoke about that person who spoke about that person, go. It doesn't work that way. The power and the authority to do the miraculous comes through prayer. It comes through a desire of spending time in God's presence. It's all of those things that when we think about it, like, well, this seems simple. This seems, this seems too easy. But in reality, if we put God first, and we view him as first. And say, God, you know what? I really like being here. I'm comfortable here. I know the people here. I know the names here. I don't know those people. I don't know that culture. I don't know what you're calling me to do. I don't know where you're calling me to go. I don't want to come over here. Well, the God who calls you to something new, he also goes before you. And I think that's the thing so many of us miss out on, is that God calls us, but he goes before us. So even if it's hard, even if it's difficult, he still goes before us. And I think we just make things so difficult because I'm not sure what somebody's going to think or what someone's going to say. One of the announcements I didn't mention and you have the opportunity to do is that we have Cooking with Guido that comes up this Thursday. And I'm just going to brag on Guido. One of the things that I've heard a couple people mention to me, but then the last time Guido said it specifically to me, is she views Cooking with Gaia not as a social club activity that the church does. And it's fun. There's nothing wrong with the church being together and having a good time and making meals together. But it's an opportunity to bring people into the church who wouldn't come into the church for any other reason. Imagine you say, you know what? We're going to make beef fajitas. It's $6. It's going to be a fabulous meal. And I'm going to pay for you to come. I want you there so much that I'm going to cover your $6. And I'll, I'll tell you, $6 is a stretch for you. It's a perfect opportunity for you to practice fasting a meal because you're going to get a meal in exchange. But that's a moment for us to say, you know what, let me find the opportunities. I may not be the person to be able to speak eloquently the God's words that change your life, but I can invite you into community with people who could. Each and every one of us needs to use our talents and our abilities. How can we be Priscilla? How can we be Aquila? How can we be the individuals who will push people closer to Jesus? And it's going to look different based off of all of our talents and our giftings and abilities. But when we look at Priscilla and Aquila, I, I just have the feeling that if they were to go up to that same individual, to that same evil spirit and say, be gone in Jesus' name, I believe that they would have the confidence and that demon would know who the authority that they're speaking from comes from. That the demon wouldn't say, who are you? It would go in Jesus' name. But so often we try doing it on our own. We try making it be about us and, and our limited ability. I'll tell you that, I mean, it, I, I've told you guys just the different stories of myself. And like, I'm not, when I was in, in high school, I was not a public speaker. This would have terrified me being in front of all you this morning. I could raise my hand in the middle of the classroom. I could uh, answer questions with no problem. If you told me I had to say the very same thing that I would have said sitting down, but in front of everybody, looking at everybody, I was terrified of doing that. I really believe, for me, it was a sequence of events that happened. I liked playing saxophone. I was, <laughs> to me, I was good at it. So I did it in middle school, I did it in high school, but I felt like, man, this is what God's calling me to do when I'm in in college, so I'll go ahead 
and I'll go to Eastern Michigan, and I'll, and I went there thinking it's going to be just not where I wanted to go. But I went, and I kept growing, I kept getting better, I got more and more comfortable being on stage, and then I had to start doing solos, and I struggled at first doing solos, in just one one piece in an hour, an hour and a half, with other people playing as well. But I had to get comfortable playing that one piece in front of people that was five minutes long. And then all of a sudden, that five minute piece became a 10 minute piece, became a 20 minute piece, to I did two different senior recitals that were an hour plus of music, in which I played a couple different saxophones and my alto tenor, I played baritone and a uh, quartet, and I played the flute, which I picked up about halfway through college. And then came student teaching, and they took my instrument away, they took the thing I was good at, had me turn my back to the crowd, and gave me a baton. And it's now, okay, get these 80 middle school kids to make music. You see, there's something about it when all of a sudden you say, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm going to turn my back to the crowd, and I'm not gonna follow along. Anything that anybody was doing behind me, people could be talking, people could be on their phones, people could do whatever they wanna do. My back's to the crowd because here's my mission. My mission is to take 80 middle school students and somehow make it sound good. And it was, it was fun, it was a unique, unique experience. And then I feel like the reason why God walked me on this particular journey that he did is the last thing he did was he took the last thing that was comfortable, this little baton. You see, it, it, you wouldn't think this little baton that would be in your hand would give you a lot of confidence, but it does, because with this little baton that I can wave back and forth, then all of a sudden, 80 people listen to me because of what I'm doing with this little baton. It seems small, but it seems at the same time that it controls so much power that I can wave this baton back and forth, I can move my hands, and everybody's listening to me. This is fun. And then all of a sudden, God says, okay, get rid of the baton, and then turn around and face everybody and use your voice. Use the very thing that you didn't think you were gifted at, the very thing that you didn't think you were skilled at, because I've been preparing for this moment. See, because I also look at my background story. My parents were told that they would never be able to have kids. And so my parents adopted my, my older brother from uh, South Korea. They were looking at adopting again, and then surprise, here I am. <laughs> and when I think of that, it's God has a purpose for me. And that I may have had my struggles, I may have had my confidence issues getting up in front of people, but because I was consistent in doing the step by step by step what God's called me to do, God got me to a spot where I was okay doing the very thing that I was uncomfortable with, to now it doesn't face me. Whether it's a crowd of this size, whether I've been at youth convention and had to talk about speed of light in front of two or 3,000 people, I don't get this sense of uncomfortability anymore because I know that God has called me to it and he's went before me. Just like Priscilla and Aquila, they're getting dropped off in Ephesus. They're getting dropped off in a place that they probably don't know that well. Maybe they've been there before. Scripture doesn't tell us, but they're getting dropped off there, and Paul leaves them. And essentially, you fend for yourself. And Paul goes off on his next journey, and they know what they're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to do what we know. And then we learn more, we grow more, and then we keep doing what we know we're supposed to do. And we may feel like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know. Here's the thing. The sooner we get past, I don't know. And we focus on, yes, God. You don't need to know. You may never know why God has called you to do this one thing until you make it to heaven. And then all of a sudden, you see the bigger picture. You see the bigger puzzle. And you realize that what you were doing was just one piece in this bigger picture. That in the moment of Priscilla and Aquila, they were a part of Apollos' ministry. It may have been a small part. Maybe they have a, a significant uh, period through the, the rest of their lives, and they do a lot of ministry. It doesn't get recorded. We don't know about it. But this one moment from two tent makers that anybody else may have just looked down on, they were able to change things. Now, the last thing I really want to hit on, because I think you kind of get my idea that for all of us in this room, that we need to look at ourselves, that God has great plans in store for us, is that sometimes, from the same story of the sons of Sceva, that sometimes we allow things to separate us from God. 
And when we look back in this passage of scripture again, I just want you to hear it one more time. A number of those who had practiced evil magic brought their scrolls together. They set them on fire out in the open. They added up the values of the scrolls. The scrolls were worth more than someone could earn in two lifetimes. The word of the Lord spread everywhere and became more and more powerful. So often we say, okay, God, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. But I'm going to hold everything else that I like back over here on the side. And I'm just not going to get rid of it because if this, if this Jesus thing doesn't work out, then I can go back to whatever this is over here. In the case here, it's magic scrolls that are worth more than somebody can make in two lifetimes. Now, I, I don't get a dollar amount or a, a currency where I could try and figure that out from that particular passage. But let's just say, I mean, for some... For everybody, this number could be different of what you can make in two lifetimes. But let's just imagine for a moment that it was $200 million. Obviously, yes, we know some people uh, in, in, our, in our culture can make that in a lifetime. But let's just say that it was $200 million, the scroll value. I don't know a single person who would say, you know what, let me just burn $200 million of dollar bills just for fun. And if you saw someone attempting to burn $200 million in dollar bills, I think most of us would go, well, let me try and get something out of there before it burns. Because that's valuable. For them, that was valuable. This was something that mattered. This is something, as a community, they made a decision of, I'm going to destroy the very things that are holding me back from Jesus. You see, we have the problem of saying so often, of I want to follow after Jesus, I want to do the things he's called me to do, but I'm not willing to let go of these things that are holding me back. Here's my challenge for all of us today. One, and the worship team, if you can go ahead and come on up. One is don't give up on yourself just simply because you don't think your gifting and your ability is good enough. That your talent is not great enough. Because if you have a pulse this morning, if there is air coming in and out of your body, God's got a mission for you still. There's still a purpose, there's still a call, and we need to continue following after that. But then also, if there's anything separating you from being the best you for Christ, we need to get rid of it. We cannot continue holding on to junk and assuming that God is going to allow us to hold on to that junk. We serve a holy and righteous God. A God that is calling us. A God that will forgive us. But a God that has clear expectations of where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. And we hold on to things that don't matter because we're afraid. Of, well, what if this Jesus thing doesn't work out? Well, when we look through scriptures, all the people who were sold out for Christ... Dare I say that it worked out for them? It may not have always been easy. It may not have always been fun. But when we're serving Jesus, we know where we're going. So even the worst things of this world just pushes us that much closer to Jesus. This morning, as we just go into the song Glory to the Lord, here's the thing that happens. A lot of times it's easy to look at somebody and say, Well, you're going from glory to glory. Everything seems great and high. When you go from one high spot to the next high spot, that means that there either is a dip in the way and there's a valley, or there's a climb that you have to go. Because going from glory to glory, if it's just flat, this is not going from glory to glory, this is not going from height to height, I'm just walking across the stage right now. There's nothing changing. But to go from glory to glory might mean that you have to walk down and go through a valley and go through a struggle, and then you come back up again, and you say, okay, God, you brought me from here to there, and now you're going to take me back down again. And I know that you're going to bring me up. And the thing is, when we follow after God, we know the fact that he's going to take us from this height to the next height to the next height. And when we have valley moments, when we have struggles, we know that God has pulled us through before and that God will pull us through again. And if we can trust him to be faithful because he's proven himself faithful. And if you haven't experienced that faithfulness from God, all you have to do this morning is simply say, God, have your way in me. I give you my life. And then whatever it is that you're feeling that's holding you back from Christ, you need to get rid of it today. If 
I were to tell you that I'm a big fan of this, of the Detroit Tigers, but I was going to change my team and I was going to be a fan of the Milwaukee Brewers. But I'm going to hold on to all my Detroit Tigers things. I'm going to hold on to all the hats, all the jerseys, all the pictures, all the... And I'm just faking it. If I want to change my allegiance, I have to destroy what this was because I'm no longer that way. And the same thing comes in the kingdom of God. We want to hold on to the things that made us us. And when we hold on to the things that made us us, we're not becoming the thing that God wants us to be. So this morning as we worship, that if this is you on either side, this is not going to be a formal thing, but I want this to be a personal thing. That if you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, I just don't think that God can use me. I don't think that I'm good enough. I'm going to challenge you. Come up front and worship God and say, God, whatever it is you want me to do, whatever it is you want me to, uh, to go, Lord, have your way in my life. And that if you're thinking here this morning that something is separating me from being the best me for Christ, I'm holding on to something, I'm holding on to junk, it's time to lay it down this morning. Come up to the altar and say, God, enough of this. And lay it down on God's feet. And if it's something tangible that you need to get rid of, you need to throw out, you need to destroy, then go forward today and do that. If it's a relationship that is completely toxic and it's bad for you, you know that it's bad for you, and it's something that you've tried to redeem, it's something that you've been praying over, and that the relationship keeps dragging you down, maybe time to cut off that relationship. Whatever it may be that God's saying, you need to get rid of this. When we look back at that scripture just one more time, the word of the Lord spread everywhere. It became more and more powerful. The word of the Lord became more powerful because they got rid of the junk that was holding them back. If we as a church, if we for this community, for this county, for this state, want to experience a move of God like we've never experienced before, then we need to be willing to do something that we've never done before and lay those things down. So if you would just stand with me in worship this morning, if you need to come to the altar, this altar space is here for you this morning, but we're just going to worship together this morning before we go.